postmodernism? What what do they imply for us? What, what, is it, what does it mean as as Nietzsche is describing it, and what does it mean for us? What, what, why do we want to think about this? What, is it, what does it mean to think in this way, right? And, and this is really the key to the class. So, so we'll spend a little bit of time introducing it today. So let's finish this discussion of nominalism and especially really talk about the last page, okay? So nominalism is, the theory or an account, alternative theory or an account of what language is, how it operates, how it operates, and how both of those things, what language is and how it operates, constructs human individuality or subjectivity, and by extension, meaning, value, and purpose, right? This is the key, okay? So, so it's an alternative account of language and it's an alternative to metaphysical accounts of mind and language. We talked about that last, last Tuesday, so I don't need to repeat all of that. But so let's just walk through it again. And, and, and if, you, if you follow each of the four or five points and you understand them conceptually, right, then, then you're going to be well on your way to understanding really how postmodernism views reality, how it views subjectivity, how it views the social and political space. Okay, and that's the key to the course, right? So, so first, for nominalism, right? In and of itself, right? The, the cosmos, the world, even human life in a deep primordial sense, in and of itself, the, the cosmos, the world, human life, the things in the world have no inherent meaning, value, or purpose. They're real. They're absolutely real. And they are things that are the effects of causes that have nothing to do with human mind. So the cosmos is out there. There are all sorts of things and processes that exist and are real, I suppose, but those things are the effects of causes, other things and processes out there that have nothing to do with human states of mind or with human language. Okay, this is critical, right? And it's critical because already we're in an alternative conception of what language is and how it operates. Because for all metaphysical theories, for Platonism, for Christian theology, and even for the Enlightenment, a core assumption of, of each one of those metaphysical systems of thought is the assumption that the cosmos and the world and human beings and human life and human beings, those things all possess in one way or another somewhat, some essential what? Truth. Well, truth is where we're going, Jacob, but they all possess, even at this first level, they all possess some what? Meaning. Yeah, love you. Perfect. Love you guys. They possess meaning. The, and not only do they possess meaning, they possess a kind of what? Value. Right? Right? There's a, there's, there's a, there's a true meaning of justice out there. Right? There's a true account of human nature. Right? There's a true, there's a, there's a meaning. There's a meaning out there, both in the cosmos, right? Plato literally thought the cosmos was geometric. He thought it was mathematical, literally. Plato thought the cosmos was, ge was, it, was, was, was complex geometry in, in kind of the same way that the, the physicists think that, that the cosmos is, is, is waves of light are also mathematical. The cosmos is mathematical. There's meaning. And not just that the cosmos and, and things in the world and human life, not just there's real meaning out there, but some things have value, right? Justice, justice is a valuable thing, right? Quantum entanglement is kind of a valuable thing to know, 
right? God, God created the universe. So the universe has meaning. It has value. It's God's creation. It hangs together in a certain way. So there's order and there's purpose, right? And so right off the bat, sort of nominalism as, a, as an alternative account of language, of what it is and how it operates and, and how those two different accounts of language produce reality, produce consciousness, produce subjectivity, produce things that mean and have value and then get organized into systems of purposes, what we call action. So for nominalism in and of itself, the cosmos has no inherent meaning, value or purpose. It's real. Of course it's real. There's all sorts of heavy things going on. The cosmos and, and the world and everything in it, these things aren't figments of our imagination. This isn't, this isn't a kind of reductionist philosophical experiment. The stuff is real, the shit is real. And it's out there and there are things and there are processes and those things and processes are the effects. And, and try to just memorize this because once you, once you memorize it and once it resonates with you, it starts to, okay, I, okay. Think about this. In and of itself, cause the things and the processes out in the cosmos and the world and our own, even, even human bodies and beings in some historical sense, in and of itself, those things don't possess inherent, objective, essential, metaphysical meaning, value, or purpose. And whatever they are, those things and those processes are the effects of causes that have nothing to do with human states of mind or human language. Okay. Right? All right. Okay. Now, already that's radical because it's questioning. It's questioning the metaphysical assertion that the cosmos does have meaning. Plato thought the cosmos was mathematical. Christians think the cosmos was created by God, right? So it has meaning. And not just meaning, but value. And not just value, but purpose. And not just the cosmos, but the earth. God created the earth and all the, and as the Bible says, all the animals and the humans on it. And humans are, are made in God's image. That's the meaning. That the meaning of the fucking human in Christianity is that you're made in God's image. And because that's your meaning and you have a soul, you have value. And because you have that value of that meaning, that value of a purpose, you have a normative plan for your life. I can live well. Right? Same thing in, in science, right? There's, there's meaning. Right? Inside our brains are all sorts of ne bio, neuro, and chemical processes. Synaptic processes, bio, neuro, synaptic chemical processes. Right. And, and, and by the way, we can we, we can understand those meanings. We can do complex geom uh, uh, chemistry. Right. And we can, we can distill blood and we can do all sorts of biochemistry and chemistry. We can we can understand the kind of language and the meaning of of chemistry of the bio neural processes. And then we can say, well, some have some of those processes are more valuable than others because we want you to be alert and not depressed. We want you to be healthy and not sick. And then the meaning and the values can get pressed into purposes. Yeah, your purpose is to be sexually healthy and mentally healthy and, and a healthy marriage and, and, and healthy body weight and healthy food. And so you can go to the fucking factory and make cars and, you know, then die. It's called capitalism. All right. So, so, so this first point anomalism is critical. You got to get it in your head just so you can get to the next step, right? Something that is really hard for us. We we're just kind of playing with Leslie River before class. This is really hard for us to get in our heads because we, whether we, we are the heirs of some form of metaphysics, we're obsessed with the idea that things have meaning. They have to have meaning. The cosmos has to have meaning. It's either God or it's, it's geometric, or, you know, it's, it's, it's mathematical and chemical for the scientists. It's got to have meaning. And from that meaning derives value. Yeah, now we have a hierarchy of value. And then we can orient it into systems of action called purposes. So the first step is just to kind of just step away from that belief, right? That in and of itself has no, there, there, there is no original language. There is no original mathematics. There is no original word of God. In and of itself, the cosmos, the world and human life has no inherent or essential or primordial meaning, value, and purpose. Okay. All right.
They're oh, all students. Professor? Yep. So are you saying pretty much that nothing has meaning then? Like, because the things we hold as meanings, we don't have meaning. See, okay, here we go. Let, let's, now let's get to the next point, okay? Again, so Jennifer, this is a great question, right? And this is why, this is why I wanted to stop, finish this lecture before we jumped into the next outline. We really gotta, we, we gotta own this moment. This is the moment we gotta own. Yeah. Okay? Right. Now, Jennifer, your question is fabulous. And, and literally, Jennifer, your question arrives, has arrived in every class that I've taught, this class, I've taught this class for 25 years. And your question arrives at exactly the same time in the class, <laughs> literally, like, like, it's almost a schedule. It's almost metaphysical, right? <laughs> right? And, 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 and your question is beautiful, okay? And it reveals, it reveals the power and the influence of metaphysical systems of thought on who we are and how we view reality, right? And in fact, we can even be playful a little bit, right? This is, this is exactly what, at the deepest level, what Nietzsche and Foucault are talking about in terms of postmodernism. When they raise the question, Right when Nietzsche and Foucault raised the question, when postmodernists raised the question, what are the consequences to our minds, bodies, and our politics that derive from our belief in and commitment to some sort of metaphysical truth that has normative and moral orientation? What's the consequences? Well, the first damn con, one of the big consequences, is that we aren't even able to conceive of meaning or the possibility of meaning unless it is somehow grounded in what? Truth. We're not even able to conceive the possibility, right? As Jennifer said, right? Jennifer's question is beautiful, right? It's beautiful, and 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 the and it, and, and, and it asks the, the what it asks reveals the profound influence of some form of metaphysics, right? Because Jennifer, Jennifer, say the question again exactly the way you said it. I said are, there nothing has are, meaning. Are you saying then? You said, are you saying that there is no what? Meaning. Meaning. And equally as important, you said, are you saying that there is no meaning? And are you saying that the things we value have no meaning, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, let's have some fun. Now, first thing we said, as a kind of postulate, in and of itself, the cosmos, world, life, has no inherent what? Meaning, value, or purpose. But you think, well, but there's meaning everywhere. We're in, we're in systems of meaning right now. We're speaking a language. You understand the language. We understand the words that we're using and, and, and generally the meaning that we're assigning to them. There's meaning everywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. There's me there is meaning, there's absolute meaning. Now, where did the meaning come from? And does it mean that our meaning is meaningless? Nope. 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 You have meaning. We have meaning. We're in systems of meaning. Right? So, so in a way, the world isn't meaningless. Right? It's not meaningless. You mean something to me. We have our friendships. We have our class. We have our shared concerns. We have some loosely um, similar political, you know, sort of uh, allegiances. Okay, right. The only thing we're saying is that, in and of itself, those things and those processes out there have no inherent meaning. In and of themselves, they have no inherent meaning. Okay, that's fine. They're real. 
but they don't have meaning. They're real, but they don't have meaning. Okay, so then where does meaning come from? Where does meaning come from? Okay, if it, if it, if it, doesn't, if, if it doesn't come from nature in Plato's sense, or God in the Christian sense, right? Where does it come from? Well, two, all meaning, value, and purpose, language, all language is a human invention, right? It's, it's, a, it's a human invention. The word, to speak the word, first to articulate the marks, as we were talking about on Tuesday, what is the A, what is the little B, what is the C, what is the D, right? Those marks, those scratches, those things are human inventions, they're artificial. They're, they, they, they emerge from the human need to signify or to represent things we are encountering in the world at a very primordial sense. And those marks, there's 26 of them in the English alphabet, get kind of created. And from the marks, the letters, we can rearrange those into words, bat, cat, tree, sun, man, woman, good, bad. We can arrange the letters, the marks, the arbitrary human invented marks into signs to signify both concepts, good, bad, tree, dog, cat, okay? And we can construct kind of language. And in through the construction of the, of the, of the little marks and, and then the way the marks become the signs and then the way the signs become the words, once we start collectively agreeing, yeah, that, that, that sign, cat, C-A-T, we'll use that to designate that ill-tempered furry thing. Or we'll use it to designate tree, that, that, that kind of brownish, greenish thing. Anybody begin, think about this, even the brownish, greeny things, those are also what? Those are also what? They're words, they're words. Right? The, the, the fact that we call bark bark and we call some bark brown and we call those things leaves and some of them are green and some are yellow, all of those are what? They're words. They were they are words built up of all sorts of little marks, on, and which all of it is from the very origin arbitrary. Right? But, but it, is, it is kind of constructed and put together in this system. Which is both, which by the way, is both a human invention. Someone had to invent that. It was invented at some point. Now, at, as we were talking about with Leslie earlier, what point was that? I don't know. And by the way, how come we don't know? Because we can't get behind the first mark. <laughs> right? One of the most fascinating things we're going to learn when we, if we ever get there, when we talk about that lecture about, about the Homeric myths. Right? The Homeric myths, Western civilization, the origin of Western civilization. We, Nietzsche wants us to locate with the Iliad and the Odyssey, right? The first two epic poems in Western civilization. There are some earlier epic poems in, in, in other civilizations, Gilgamesh in the Eastern tradition, right? There, there, there are others, but in the, in the West, in what we call the West, the first two epic poems were the Iliad and the Odyssey, written, we think, by Homer. And they're important, and we'll talk about this next week. I don't want, I'm just trying to explain this to Jennifer, right? They're important because they're the first two written, written epic poems. Everything, everything in Western tradition prior to the Iliad and the Odyssey, it wasn't written. How was it explained? Orally, they had some words but they didn't have a written language. Or if they did, they had a very basic and it wasn't saved, it wasn't reiterated. The Iliad and the Odyssey are the first examples of a written poem that tells a story, that gives meaning. Hey, there's this place called Troy, and there's this place called these Athenians, and there's this dude, dude called Paris, and there's this woman called Helen, and there was a fucking epic war. 
right? And to so even the Odyssey become the first two epic poems that are written and then rewritten. But before that, there was what? There's nothing. I mean, there were things. There were all sorts of people that lived and they traded and they did things, but, but, but there's no what? Written record. We can't, we'll, we'll never know. And we don't even know if Homer was a real person. We have no idea. We think the Homeric era was 750 BC to 650 BC, but we have no idea there's no, there, because there was nothing written before, before Homer. There's no record. There's no archaeological record. There's no written record. There's no anthropological record. Yeah, there are stone, there, there are, you know, ruins of people living there, but we know nothing about them. It's an, it's a, it's an abyss. It's nothing. And you're never going to be able to, you're never going to, and, and, and once you are written, and, and the Iliad the Odyssey becomes the foundation of Western civilization, and Greek tragedy emerges out of the Homeric traditions, and the Platonic philosophy emerges to replace Greek tragedy, and then Christianity comes, and then the enlightened science, come, science comes, and enlightenment comes. You're inside, you're in a poem, inside a poem, inside a poem, inside a poem. And, and, and now you can't get outside of the poem to see what was before Homer. There's nothing before Homer. So, so all those things, all those people and those places, those, and even the people and the language they spoke and how they lived and the geographical places they lived, all those things, did they exist or not exist before Homer? They existed. Of course they existed. But in a weird way, we don't know how to assign them what? Meaning. How do you assign them meaning? What was their, what was their meaning? Didn't have meaning. In, in a weird way for us. No meaning. No value and purpose. Those things, as we understand them, don't emerge until the Iliad and the Odyssey. And then the way those narratives and those poems and those texts have been unstable and agonistic and conflictual and restylized and changed all the way to this moment in world history in the West. We talk about the Greek world, right? Talk about the Greek world. Prior to the Iliad and the Odyssey, there was no Greek world. If, if you were to ask somehow magically people who lived prior to Homer, they would have never described themselves as what? Greek. Greek. Didn't exist. The concept of a Greek people didn't exist. Didn't exist. It's an invention. Homer invents it in the Iliad and the Odyssey. The damn poem invents the Greek world. The Greek world invents Western civilization. The Greek world isn't something metaphysically true. It's not, it's not inherent. When you, when, you, when, you, when you look at the, 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 the world of the Greek world in Thucydides, great, the great Peloponnesian War, right? And Thucydides has all these maps and this 3,000 page, the history of the Peloponnesian War, the Great War between the, the, the Athenians and the Spartans, which engulfed the entire Greek world. And you look at Thucydides' little maps, you got Western Turkey and you've got Northern Greece and Macedonia to the east and now what we now call Croatia and all the way up, up the Adriatic and then all down through, through Italy and then through, through the bottom of Italy and North Africa. When you look at the Greek world, it's an invention. It's an entire invention that emerges out of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And as those sort of myths and those sort of ideas become more stabilized. So the original meaning of the entire Western civilization, what we call Western civilization was itself a human construction. It was literally a work of art. 
literally, in the Iliad and the Odyssey. And they're important because whoever, and by the way, we don't even know who Homer was. We talk like he, he or she, or they as a little group of people, we talk like they're real people. We don't have a clue that Homer was a real person. We have no archeological record. We have no historical record. Zero. It's a fantasy. It's a fantasy. It's a myth. Homer's a myth. And because whoever wrote the damn, whether it was a group of poets, whether it was one poet, who, or, or some people even think Homer refers to a region. You can't get behind it. You can't get behind the language to, to know because there were no records. There's no records, all oral tradition. It's all spoken. So how in the hell do you want to get behind the Homeric era, even if you want to say it was around 750 BC? How, what, how, how, how do you measure meaning before there was written meaning and, and conveyed meaning in a structure that makes sense to us? It's not possible. So if, even if you wanted to think about the in Western civilization about this idea, right? Prior to the ill and the Odyssey, there were all sorts of things that were real and they existed and they were doing all sorts of things. There were effects of causes, right? But none of that was Greek. None of it constituted the Greek world. None of it constituted a collective and organized moral system and religious system and, and royal hierarchical system and, 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 and religious system. That's it. All of that was a construction. It was a human invention. And, and literally, I mean, I feel so ridiculous speaking like this. Literally an invention. It was, a, it was an epic poem. It was a work of art, literally. And art in its most radical sense is artificial. And not only was it a work of art, artificial, a human invention in terms of, it, 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 and also in terms of just the writing. In fact, it was the first time it was written down. But it was also simultaneously, as we're also seeing with nominalism, because it produces Western civilization. It produces the Homeric epic. It produces the Homeric condition. It produces the Greek world. It's also an assertion of what? Power. It's also an assertion of power, right? Because it is naming things. It is giving value to things. It is, it is organizing these people and this area into a common set of purposes. Hey, we're Greek. We're not barbarians. See those Persians over there? East of, east of Western Turkey, all the way up into the middle of barbarians. Right? It organizes purposes. So, so this question, Jennifer, is really beautiful. We have to get it in our mind that meaning can be created and can exist, but it is not true or it's not connected to anything objectively or essentially true. There's all sorts of meaning. In fact, in fact, the problem is, as you guys know, and as we know, in a weird way, there's too much meaning. In fact, in fact, as what Nietzsche will just ask us to realize, what Foucault will ask us to realize, not only is there meaning, and by the way, you don't need, you don't need metaphysics to have meaning. They invent little marks, A's and B's. They put those little marks into signs. They assign meaning to those signs. A bunch of people agree that that, that sign cat is the, is a sign that represents that damn thing. And now you have a word and now you have a meaning. And then we, and then we can have a debate. Are cats valuable? No, cats are horrible. Oh, no, 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 cats are fabulous. You just don't understand cats. <laughs> and now you've got too much meaning. You've got, now you've got a debate over value. And now you've got ag on, now you've got conflict, which is at the root of all language as a human invention and an assertion of power. Because you're inventing the word. You're inventing the meaning, and in doing that, you're assigning power, uh, value, and now that's power. 
And, and again, you guys know that. You're, you're caught up in that world. Right? You are caught up in, right now, right? We're, you, you forget political theory for a minute. We're, we're, the United States is in an absolute existential political, philosophical crisis over what America is going to what? What's going to mean? What does it mean? What do we value? How do we organize our purposes, right? Literally, the city is on fire. And it's a conflict over meaning. Okay. All right. It happens at both the personal level. All right. If you're in an abusive relationship, you're in an abusive relationship because someone is imposing meaning on you. Someone is imposing value on you. Someone is making you feel inferior. Someone is making you feel trapped. Someone is making you feel stuck. It's meaning. Someone is defining you. Okay, you're in a conflict of meaning. Yeah, I'm straight. Now you can say to yourself, well, I, you know, I'm gonna resolve that conflict by finding the truth. Okay, that's fine. But you're still in a conflict of meaning. So, so one of the first things we have to do is we have to get our mind around the possibility that there can be meaning without truth conceived of in the metaphysical way. That there is meaning without truth or that meaning isn't grounded in metaphysical truth. Now here's the second thing that's almost impossible for us to do. First, and this was really what Jennifer's question was getting at, and it's the, it's the right question. You gotta you gotta you gotta bash through this question if you're gonna understand Nietzsche and Foucault. Not only do you have to understand that meaning can exist without it being grounded in an objective truth, of some sort, because in and of itself the world doesn't have meaning. It didn't have meaning. It can't. Then have language. Trees don't have languages. language out there in the cosmos. They're just things and processes that there are effects of causes that have to do with human mind or language. So the first thing is, is that there can be meaning without, without two objective essences. And then two, and this is, this is what is almost impossible. And this, this is really at the core of Jennifer's question. And it's a great question because it's shattering to us. It's shattering. Can we still value that meaning? Well, if, if nothing means anything, and meaning is just a human invention, and ultimately nothing has meaning in the, in the, you know, in the objective metaphysical sense, well, then why do anything? Why value anything? Oh, why, why should I value anything? And by the way, this is, this, is, this is the most toxic consequence of metaphysics. This is, for Nietzsche and Foucault, this is the most toxic. If you need some type of metaphysics to value your meaning, value, and purpose, if you can't conceive of the creation and the assertion of meaning and value, Without the necessity of, of Plato's geometric universe and his, and his true idea of justice or the Christian or the Islamic notion of God or the hope that there's some scientific sort of norm to the healthy mind, the healthy sexuality, the healthy parenting. If you can't conceive who the fuck you are and where your value and where your meaning derives without those things, you're lost. That's Nietzsche's point. That's Foucault's point. Right? That is, that is, from Nietzsche and Foucault's point, the most profound of the negative, of the negative consequences that derives from a belief in and commitment to some kind of metaphysics. That's that, that is really the point. 
If you are unable to give your life meaning and by extension value in the absence of some metaphysical truth, you're incapable of action. You're incapable of action, ultimately, of a, of a kind of autonomous action. Right? And, and if there is a, a kind of a deeper reason for why I teach this class, it's this, right? What happens when, or why is this important? Why is it important to at least conceive, even if it's just an intellectual exercise, of the possibility that one, there is no objective metaphysical truth out there or to myself, that I have to, in some way, even though I'm, I'm the effect of a poem, that's true, but once I become aware of the fact that I'm the effect of a poem, take some agency inside the poem to, 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 to fight with the narrative and the values and the meanings that are oppressing me. Once I take up some agency to do that, and then God forbid, even, no pun intended, imagine even to begin in a small way the process of giving my life me, because I'm tired of being defined by my ethnicity. I'm tired of being defined unnaturally or immorally. I'm tired of being oppressed. Because that's, that's what systems of meanings do. And I don't even mean that in a negative way. That's what they do there. They're systems of meaning to put, to name people. Yeah, you're a male and you're a black male and you're a Chinese woman, right? And you've got a high IQ or you, you're, you're, you're in a learning disability. So that's what they do. And I'm not even being negative. That's what they do. They name, define, they place, and they put in hierarchical relationships. That's what the thing does. And, it, and it, to, it, to keep going, it's got to reproduce itself in that way. That's what power structures are. That's what certain knowledge power structures are. It's what they do. Okay. All right. Okay, if you don't want to be a part of that for whatever reason, or you find your place in that, or your designation, or your meaning, or your value, oppressive, limiting, crippling, okay, one, knowing that this is a human invention and it's agonistic one it empowers you to start pushing back but also two in, in the deeper sense what happens when meaning comes apart what happens when the system of meaning that you thought was objectively true comes apart which they all do and by the way comes apart one because we're mortal everything's fragile Right from 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 a nominalist or a postmodern point of view, you it, it, and even metaphysical, we're going to die. We will die. And by extension, systems of means die. Paradigms die. We we call them paradigm shifts. We call we call that history. <laughs> Marx created a whole metaphysical theory called called Marxism about about how historical epics are in conflict and one dies and another emerges. And, yeah. If your meaning and value and purpose, if you believe it's connected to something objectively true, timeless and changeless, authorized by, by nature or God or bioneural processes that we can optimize, right? If, if, if you're committed to that idea, one, those things can't be altered from your kind of Right? They're, they're timeless and changeless. They can't be altered. They are what they are. And two, if those, for whatever reason, things that you thought couldn't be altered, <laughs> meanings and values and aspirations that you thought were objectively true couldn't be altered, if those are someday actually altered, it's shattering. Again, I'm still... Sorry for this stupid example. I'm really sorry. Maybe I'm too dramatic. Maybe it's time to stop teaching this class. No, but I'm serious. I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for emails or phone calls from at least 12 students. I'm still waiting. Why haven't I received the email or the call? Because they're still 
in their space of being shattered. Their meaning has been shattered. Their value has been shattered. Their purpose has been fucking shattered. And what are they doing right now? They're coping, to be sure. They're struggling. Right? And at some point, and this is the point where I probably lose my job, at some point they have two choices. They can either continue to die, their soul is going to die. And I mean that loosely, I don't mean that in a Christian soul. I mean their spirit, their, fucking per their, their, their reason for living, their meaning, their spirit, their soul. It's either going to continue to die because what they hoped to be true, what they thought was true, their meaning and value set out by some metaphysical story about the cosmos and God and IQ and beauty and value and success and fucking right swipes on Twinder, right? They're either going to continue, they're going to, their soul, and this is what nihilism is, this is what Nietzsche calls nihilism. And, and, and even if they continue to, to live physically, they're, they're, they're dead because they can't imagine meaning, they can't imagine revaluation, they can't imagine moving on, they're just, they're just kind of shattered. And then they say, I wish I was never born. I wish I was dead. Life is so unfair. Life is fucking horrible. Life is unjust. And by the time, by the way, by the time you get to be my age, you know a lot of people like that. You see a lot of people like that because the world has rolled them three, four, five, six fucking times and they didn't recover. They got two choices. They don't recover. Because they, they can't, they can't imagine the, the authorization of meaning and value without, without whatever they thought was true. Or, or, they read some Nietzsche and they think, oh, maybe all those things I thought were, were, were objectively meaningful and gave me my value and gave me my purpose, maybe they weren't as metaphysically certain as I thought. And now, now, okay, suffering. Nobody gets out without fucking suffering. In fact, in fact, there's no expansion of consciousness without suffering. Okay, all right. I've, I've been through some difficult things. I've, I've seen children die. I've seen people that I love die. I've been through a few near, near death experiences. I've seen dreams die. All right, okay. All right. And take some time. And I'm going to start a creative process of giving to, to renew, reanimate, recreate, reinvent meaning for who? Me, for my liking, and from that value, and from that purpose. And I'm going to do that until I die. In fact, ultimately, that's what Nietzsche means by the tragic perspective. I know, I know. That in and of itself, the life and the cosmos and the world, even life, has no inherent meaning or purpose. Okay? I know it. That's what Nietzsche means by pessimism in the attempt at self-criticism. That's the first page, second page. I know that. And I know meaning is an invention. And I know it's fragile when I'm going to die. My mind is fragile. It can come apart just like that. In fact, so much energy and so much energy and kind of intelligence and energy and creativity and just raw physical stamina just to keep my fucking mind together in some semi-coherent way. Forget from morning to night, whole time, life, it's hard. And sometimes that's going to collapse. Sometimes the collapse comes from things we do. Sometimes the collapse comes from outside forces. Look at COVID. COVID has shattered everything. It's shattered the whole myth of this society. The whole, the, the medical myth, the technological myth, the wealth myth, the stability myth, that, that, that there's a predictable tomorrow myth. That yeah, the, 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 the true thing one does is, is go and get a college education and get a law degree or get a master's degree and go on and, and do this shit. That, it shattered that whole myth. Okay. 
I'm still alive. I lived through the shattering moment. I'm still alive. Okay, now what? Now there has to be new meaning. Professor. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Mm -hmm. No, it's okay. No, no, thank God. I'm, someone <laughs> shoot me. I'm rambling on like an idiot. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. Um, I just had a question. Mm -hmm. um, within this, I guess, what would Nietzsche say about like the obsession of like having a legacy or leaving a legacy? Yeah, well, so... It is, and I'm going to use the word, I'm going to interpret your use of the word legacy broadly. But it is the meaning of life. It's the meaning of life. And Nietzsche would mean it in two ways. First, are you... In, 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 and I mean it in what he called the heroic or tragic perspective. Are you, first of all, are you heroic enough to give your life meaning? Right? Are you heroic enough to give your life meaning? To create it and to fight for it and to possibly die in the process. One, that's the first thing. Right? And, and this is why he says in the attempt at self-criticism. Is there, is there a kind of pessimism of strength, right? Is there a sharp eye kind of courage about this? There's something heroic about this, right? Do you have the ability to do that? Do you, have, do you have the desire, the hunger to do that? And then two, are you creative enough to make it last as long as it can in, this, in, in the sense of this legacy? Right, and 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 by and by the by legacy you mean meaning, right? Did something you create in terms of an idea? It can be an idea, and 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 it, and it can be justice. It can be it can be any it can be anything. It just doesn't have to be. You 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 just don't have to say I'm doing this because it's true. You you say I'm doing this because I I will it. This is, this is what I want the reality to look like. I don't need God to tell me or Plato to tell me that radical economic inequality and exploitation and oppression and fucking hatred is wrong. I don't need Plato to tell me that. I don't need the Bible to tell me that. I don't need the Quran to tell me that. I don't, I, and, and I don't even need to say, I think it's wrong because it's true. All I need to say is I think it's wrong. And I can imagine a better way to live. Now, to be sure, that's going to be conflictual because there are lots of people who don't want me to imagine that world. They're quite happy with the world they have, they've created, that they're benefiting from in all of its various ways. All right? So, so this is, this is, this, this is a conflict over meaning. It's a conflict over what your life and the world we share will mean. That's, that's, that's where it begins. That's the process. And that's where it ends. That, that is what, what the poem is. That's, if, if you wanted to think about what human life is as we have come to conceive of it, that's what it is. And if you want to talk about a legacy, right, that's fabulous. And, and when, when I hear that word and when I hear you use that word, I think, I think of legacy is that you are so intellectually powerful and creative you were able to write, help write. No one writes perfectly a whole new poem. That's why, by the way, Nietzsche says you need style and not knowledge. More on that later. Right? You need style, not knowledge. Because nothing, nothing is invented ex nihilio out of nothing. That would be impossible because you and I are always already inside of what? A language game. Okay, so, so no one invents something ex nihilio 
everybody's sampling, everybody's borrowing, everybody's stealing, everybody's sampling. I love sampling, right? You're taking one song, you're cutting it out of this, you're adding it to your own thing, and you're taking another, you're sampling, you're sampling. That's what language is. Language, language and meaning and value as it moves through history is this massive sampling. It's this agon over what things are going to mean and what you sample and what you borrow and what you steal and what you stylize. And some little creativity things. Yeah, to be sure, Joyce was a fucking genius. Joyce wrote a whole novel. No one could read it. It was so brilliant. Okay, that's, you know, Picasso blows everybody away with cubism and post-cubism. Okay, those, are, those moments exist. And they're, and they're essential, and they're, they're, they're beautiful, and they're powerful, and they're essential to life. But there's nothing, there's nothing objectively true about Picasso's moment, right? Picasso didn't make painting more true than it used to be. Joyce didn't make the modern novel. Joyce's Ulysses isn't closer to the truth of the modern novel than fucking Nabokov's Invitation to a Beheading, or Madame Bovary, or Chopin's Awakening. Stylization. So yeah, create meaning. Create create meaning that for you is meaningless. It's beautiful things. And it and, and if it does beautiful things and you can get other people to think that this is a beautiful thing and those people come with you on your quest, on your social and political quest to for whatever reason, yeah, yeah, this is what I mean. This is, goes back to Jennifer's question. You don't need a reason to do beautiful and important and transformative and powerful and fucking loving things. You don't need an objective authorization or reason to do it. You can do it. And if you, and if you have the emotional strength and the, and the creative power and, 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 and style to do that, and you find people who want to go on that journey with you, and then, and then someday when you're dead, hopefully longer than sooner, but nobody fucking knows, because that's why this is tragedy, right? You don't know. We talk like, oh, I'll, you know, when I, when I was in LA, I tell the students like this all the time. When I'm in LA, when we used to have classes in person, you know, I make this joke when we were trying to talk about time and temporality and spatiality and mortality and death, the gift of death, you know, every day. I get on my WhatsApp and talk to my wife and I see my dog and I say, I miss you. And I say, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And we start, we make plans for Croatia in the summer and where we're gonna go skiing in the winter. We, we, we talk like this. And hopefully for the most part so far, it's, it's kind of played out okay, All right, yeah. I, I did make the 10 weeks and, or the 30 weeks that I got on a fucking plane and thank God the plane flew and the pilot wasn't fucking drunk. And I landed. But nobody knows. That's another thing about what Nietzsche, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody has a clue about the next 10 minutes. We talk like we do. We talk like Homer was a real person. We talk, we talk like we know the Homeric epic was 750 BC to 650 BC, and it was a, a man or a woman, it was a real person. We put his name on the goddamn book. He's the author. We talk like these things are real and, and that, that they're expected, and, and I guess, okay, I suppose, for the most part. And this is, this is why they want you to learn statistics. Okay. All right. But statistics don't matter. Don't tell Dr. Cole this. I want you everybody to promise me. But statistics don't matter. Statistics mean nothing. If, if nine out of 10 times things are okay, but you're the one, you're the one out of the nine that happened to die. You're the one out of the nine that gets the disease. You're the one out of the nine that, that, that goes to a bar and gets fucking shot or goes to high school and gets fucking shot, right? So we talk in statistics, we talk in probabilities, but you don't know. I say, I love you guys and I'll see you Tuesday. Nobody knows. The, the love is true, but it's a hope, it's a prayer, it's a fiction, it's a longing, it's a longing. 
that nobody can guarantee, that nobody can authorize, no one can sign that check. Okay. So do heroic, meaningful, love-driven, beautiful, transformative things now. Create your meaning. Assert it as an act of power in a conflictual, moral, social, and political space to improve things. Yes. You don't need God to tell you to do that. You don't need Plato to tell you to do that. You don't need Kant to tell you to do that. You don't need Professor Dungey to tell you to do that. You can do it. And you should be doing it now. And you should do it every fucking day because every day is the, potentially the last. And, and by the way, that's why the heroic perspective is a heroic perspective. You do it knowing how it ends. You do it knowing that there's no divine or metaphysical authorization. You do it knowing you may die in the process, right? Everybody has a terminal disease. Everybody has a terminal disease right now. It's called death, period. But you're gonna do it until you can't do it anymore. And that was the purpose. That was the meaning. All right. Let's call it a day. On Tuesday, we're gonna start the next outline. I think we're done with nominalism. <laughs> um, but again, we, this has moved us in the right way. This is where we're going. And um, yeah, on Tuesday, we'll begin the next outline. Have, a, have an amazing weekend. You have a question in the chat box, Professor. I do. Mm -hmm. What is the question? Um, Jennifer asks, so meaning can be created, but it is, but it is nothing related to the objective. Yep. Absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. You can have. That sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And in fact, in fact, in fact, Nietzsche and Foucault want you to think of meaning like that. Sounds good. Thank you, Professor. Have that's a good time. Perfect. That, that's what they want. They want you to think that meaning and value can be created, that it can do powerful and transformative things, that it can create legacies, and it doesn't have to be authorized or grounded in or connected to any objective truth. Perfect. And I saw Jacob's observation, and I'm not going to let it go. <laughs> I can't imagine Nietzsche was good with children. <laughs> We should teach Nietzsche to fifth graders. If we taught Nietzsche to fifth graders, there wouldn't be any bullying. There wouldn't be any self-hatred. There wouldn't be resentment. There wouldn't be anxiety and panic attacks and fear and self-loathing. We should treat, we should teach this to fifth graders. All right. <laughs> Have a great day. Have a fabulous weekend. I hope I see you Thank Tuesday. You. Thank you, Nick. See you Tuesday. Sending much love to all of you. Thank you, Professor. Yep. Thank love you, you guys. Professor. Unconditionally. Unconditionally. Ciao, everybody. Bye now. <laughs>